and uh, Scott George is going to be talking about uh, some eDNA. Perfect. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, you know, Karin worked really hard to put together a great theme for our meeting this year of fish on the move, and I've done my absolute best to undermine that by presenting a, a presentation on a somewhat sedentary species that, at least in our study area, is is not so much on the move, and that's one of the, the mysteries that we're, we're trying to tackle here. But um, we're going to present some brown goby research that spanned uh, the past three years, looking at their eastward expansion towards the, the Hudson River uh, through the Mohawk and the, and the Barge Canal system. Uh, I'm going to intentionally blast through the background and methods as uh, brutally fast as possible because I think most folks are pretty up on the goby invasion at this point, and I have a lot of really interesting uh, results that I want to spend our time on. But you know, we're aware goby are an invasive uh, benthic fish that showed up in North America in 1990. They have a number of problematic uh, ecological effects and admittedly probably some beneficial ones too, but we don't like to talk about that. Um, they colonize all five Great Lakes in approximately five years, which is kind of unprecedented. And this is a rough look at their distribution at the watershed scale uh, in the United States. More relevant to my research, uh, looking at their uh, invasion towards eastern New York, they showed up uh, in Oneida Lake, I want to say maybe 2012, someone in Shackleton could probably correct me on that, but they went from first detected to the most abundant benthic fish in Oneida in approximately two years, which is uh, pretty astonishing. And what got us uh, you know, involved in this project was when an angler captured one at Utica at Lock 20 in 2014. And that got us asking a lot of questions, where actually is the invasion front at that time, and you know, where, where are they going to go? And of course, the danger is they hit the Hudson River, at which point they can go north, uh, up the Hudson, into the Champlain Canal, and into Lake Champlain. And presumably, Lake Champlain would be great goby habitat, as far as I can tell. And uh, moving downstream, of course, some unknown distance into the Hudson River estuary, potentially. Um, our goal was twofold. Uh, we wanted to try to figure out the best early detection technique for tracking the invasion front, and we wanted to figure out how fast they were moving. A number of studies in other states have shown that they can you know, colonize large distances of new habitat in a single year. So we used a comparative method study, seining, trawling, minnow trapping, and environmental DNA using qPCR. We employed those techniques at 12 sites in spring and summer during three consecutive years. And those sites are distributed between Oneida Lake and Sylvan Beach, our positive control site, uh, all the way down actually to the Hudson River um, below the Troy Dam. Um, I'm going to blast through the fish sampling methods because that's not the interesting part of this talk, but we did uh, three seine poles using a 30-foot bag seine at each site. Uh, minnow traps, we used two traps per site, G minnow traps uh, baited with cheese and dog food, modeled after the uh, Alpena uh, Michigan uh, Fish and Wildlife folks. Trawling. We used a Siamese trawl, a relatively small trawl. We did three poles at each site during each survey. And I say this every year, but it gets truer every year, so I keep saying it. If you haven't trawled on an urban river before, you, you just don't know what you're missing. And each, each year, the slide I'm about to show gets more and more diverse and interesting, but I mean, we catch such a wide variety of both natural and anthropogenic items on the bottom, and most of them are heavily colonized by dracidid mussels, which makes them very hazardous for our technicians. And it's, uh, if the thing didn't catch goby so well, uh, Barry would have thrown it out years ago. It's been uh, kind of a nightmare, honestly. Uh, for the eDNA field methods, uh, we conduct two field replicates at each site. Each is composed of two liters that are filtered. Uh, we have a through a glass fiber filter, and we have a standard decontamination procedure. And as an additional fail-safe, uh, we're going from downstream to upstream. So even if we have any kind of you know, failure with our decontamination, uh, this is an additional fail-safe. Uh, I'm skipping the eDNA lab methods completely. Um, you can certainly talk to me about that later. And Chris and Meredith, our partners with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, are much better adept to talk about that anyway. But we're using the Nathan et al. 2015 marker uh, quantitative PCR. So we're into results. Uh, all of my graphs are going to be set up the same way. So the sampling periods are shown here, starting with spring 2016 down to summer 2018. And colored dots will be imposed on the sampling sites where goby were captured. And the reason you don't see any colored dots is because minnow trapping has been a complete bust for us. So we have captured a lot of things in our traps, but no round goby. And it's especially painful when I talk to the ESF 
people uh, who tell me, I was talking to Anna yesterday, who said, oh yeah, we can catch 15 in an unbaited trap in a, in a single night, and uh, we have not captured a, a one. So why, I mean, part of the reason is they're just not widespread through the system, but the other gear types, as you'll see, have certainly performed a lot better. Um, seining. The canal is pretty lousy seining habitat, the only site in which we're catching goby in our seines. We're catching them at a very low density at our positive control site on Sylvan Beach. That's about a quarter mile uh, to the east of Oneida Lake, give or take. But no captures anywhere east of that location, and also no captures in 2018 for whatever reason. The trawling. At least through 2017, we thought we had a pretty good handle on what the trawling was showing. We were seeing major seasonal differences in the spring. Trawling in the deep water in the canal seemed to be catching a very low density of goby at Sylvan Beach, and trawling in the summer was catching a very high density of goby. Uh, we were averaging over 200 goby per trawl pole in August 2017. Then inexplicably in 2018, they largely vanished, and talking to some of the folks that work on Oneida, they've seen similar declines uh, in Oneida in 2018. But what was interesting was we had our first captures at the Rome location uh, in August 2018. Getting into the environmental DNA, um, a couple caveats here. First, I'm showing this as number of laboratory replicates positive. Ultimately, we're going to publish uh, you know, with copies per liter of ambient river water and CT scores. But this is just a quick and dirty way to visualize presence and absence. Um, Again, it's out of 16 because we have two field replicates and they're each run in octet at the lab, so that's how you get to 16. And I'm only showing you right now on purpose through June 2017. I showed this exact slide last year. So this was fairly interpretable. We're red hot at Sylvan Beach at our positive control site. Inexplicably, we're negative at Rome. And at Utica, we're seeing moderate to strong levels of positives, and just because of biological data, we have this awkward one out here that we're struggling to, to understand. So this was the story I presented last year. We had just received the August 2017 data prior to last year's meeting, and we had some concerns about what it showed and if we had contamination issues or if our marker was failing or what exactly was going on. So uh, I'm going to show you those data now, and then I'll show you the process that we've gone through to try to vet and understand this data. Um, this is August 2017, red hot at Sylvan Beach, strongest signal we've seen at Utica, still negative at Rome, but we have these very concerning positives in the Amsterdam Schenectady area, well downstream of where we think uh, the invasion front is. So of course, the first thing you wonder is, do we have contamination, right? With environmental DNA, that's always your worst nightmare. Um, so of course, we have uh, lab field blanks that we filter, and they were consistently negative through this survey and all others. Plus, we're working from downstream up, so it's kind of hard to understand how we would have gotten our gear fouled um, coming from the east. So again, field blanks were negative. Um, again, Chris and Meredith uh, run a whole suite of both negative extraction controls and uh, P negative PCR controls. They all came back negative as well. So if we rule out contamination, or at least as best we can, the next thing you wonder, are we amplifying a non-target sequence? So is this a species that maybe has a similar sequence to what we're looking for, and we're accidentally amplifying it because maybe the Nathan et al. marker isn't as specific as we hoped it was. So Chris and Meredith, um, we took a step back. We wanted to really vet these results carefully. Um, you know, Managers often hate eDNA because they get these spurious positives that they have to try to interpret that may or may not correspond to fish actually being there. So the beauty of eDNA, though, is that you can go back in time. All of these samples are archived. So Chris and Meredith, uh, they looked at the Nevers et al. 2018 marker uh, that had just come out, and they developed their own marker in-house. And they did very rigorous both sensitivity and specificity testing. They decided they felt pretty good with the Nevers et al. marker. So we went back in time and reran our extracts all the way back to 2016 which is really neat that you can do that with eDNA. I can't go back and pull a trawl in 2016, but we can go back and look at our DNA extracts. We were hopeful that some of these, what I'll call spurious positives, or that we hope are spurious positives, would disappear um, if we used a superior marker with greater specificity. And it compounded our problem. Um, <laughs> not only did we reconfirm these hits in the Amsterdam Schenectady area, but we have a few weak hits to the west, and really concerning two hits on the Hudson below the Troy Dam. Uh, I want to be extremely clear. It is my personal opinion that I will try to convince you of for the next few minutes that these do not represent Gobi populations at these locations. Uh, what they do represent uh, is certainly open for discussion, and I want to pull in the 2018 
data, which is much more clean and tidy. Um, you'll see very strong positives at our positive control site. Interestingly, Rome is picking up steam quickly, which that corresponds to the actual captures of Gobi at that location during the same survey, so that's kind of neat when your gear is actually telling you the same thing. Utica, another strong signal, and no positives anywhere to the east of there. Um, so what does that mean, and what does that tell us? Um, I'm going to put that thought on hold for a moment. And another thing that's been irking me about this data set, you'll recall Utica, 2014, an angler captured a specimen at this location. In three years and six rounds of surveys in the Utica area, about a quarter mile downstream of where the angler captured their specimen, the eDNA is consistently very hot, and we have not captured a single goby in our traditional gear. That's been driving me nuts, right? I mean, what is going on here? Why is the eDNA so hot, yet our traditional gear is not capturing goby? So, You've heard of simple random sampling, you've heard of stratified sampling, you may have even heard of convenience sampling. Uh, we went out and conducted frustration sampling. And <laughs> I, put, I went out with Jeremy Wright and Brian Weatherwax in the New York State Museum. We threw on the backpack shocker and in a very unscientific way just did presence absence surveys at a number of spots on the canal in the Utica area trying to figure out what are we missing? Why is the DNA signature so strong yet we're having a horrible time catching these fish? And literally, the first site we went to, uh, we went to the Lock 20 Park, dropped the shocker in, it's about a quarter to a half mile upstream of our eDNA site, and wouldn't you know it, um, within a matter of minutes, we probably had 50 goby. They were the dominant fish, um, absolutely high density. And just to put things in perspective, we're collecting eDNA and conducting our seining, trawling, and trapping all in this area. Um, this is Lock 20, the narrow spot here. On both sides of Lock 20, we encountered a really high density of goby. And we also actually captured a single goby on the natural river channel of the Mohawk here. And to my knowledge, there are no immediate connections to the canal in this exact area, which means that fish presumably came in um, from somewhere to the west. And there may potentially be goby at this point scattered around the natural channel as well. So this, in my opinion, was a pretty actually significant outcome because it gave the eDNA a big thumbs up that had been telling us the correct story for about three years and um, goby appear to be very patchy right now which is one of the things I'm going to talk about here. So how do we explain the August 2017 results? Um, I mean the short answer is we can't entirely. Um, you can never rule out contamination with total confidence but I mean we have a good suite of controls that suggest it was not contamination. Um, you know again could it be that we amplified non-target DNA seems unlikely based on our marker validations and why would it only happen during one survey period. So finally you get to the point there's just inherent challenges with environmental DNA. You're trying to detect the presence of the DNA as a surrogate for the presence of the organism, but they're not exactly synonymous. You can have DNA without the presence of the organism in that immediate vicinity and this has been something that's plagued some of the Asian carp uh, research as well. So ultimately, did we have some kind of strange hydrologic event? Did, was there some kind of dredging activity that mobilized a lot of material? Um, we don't know the answer to that question, and unfortunately, probably never will. Um, that aside, the remaining five surveys, and even about half the surveys at the August 2017 um, period, really are right on point and are highly interpretable. Uh, I would say, in many examples, the eDNA has been more sensitive and given us a more robust picture of what's going on than the traditional fish sampling gear. In Utica, we failed to capture a goby, the eDNA has been red hot, and finally because the eDNA put us on the right path, we've discovered within a half mile of that area there's a really dense goby population. Similarly at Rome, uh, the eDNA had been, very low detections had been forecasting uh, the captures um, that showed up in Rome in August 2018. So a strong argument to be made there as well. I will say, I would not be very uncomfortable, I would be uncomfortable interpreting the eDNA data without the benefit of some of the traditional gear. Uh, you know, long term, if you rely on eDNA, you certainly still want to have the traditional gear available to confirm any findings uh, periodically. Uh, without the trawl results, I would be much less comfortable interpreting this data set. And I should also mention, um, Gobi distributions appear to be extremely patchy right now, and we don't have a great handle on exactly why that is, but obviously at Utica, um, high evidence of patchiness, and 
Even at Sylvan Beach in 2017, we're catching a really high density of goby, and in 2018, we can barely capture any, which, like I said, was somewhat congruent with what the, the Shackleton Point folks have told me about Oneida during the same period. But this is bad news for using our traditional gear, which is kind of spatially limited in how much area we can cover. I think the eDNA is much more robust to the patchiness issue because obviously the water all flows the same direction and you can take advantage of that. Um, we still see not a whole lot of evidence or strong evidence suggesting downstream expansion around Gobi. Again, an angler took one in Utica in 2014 and I stand here in, what are we, February 2019 here, almost five years later, and I can't tell you definitively that Gobi have moved downstream of that point. Um, it's entirely possible that the eDNA will have the last laugh from the August 2017 results and maybe you know, we do have low density populations and that will be confirmed shortly, but we certainly can't say that with any kind of confidence right now. And I'll admit I'm a bit puzzled why, entirely puzzled, why they haven't advanced more quickly based on what we've seen in most other regions. And you know, whether it has to do with you know, availability of tracinid mussels also potentially being patchy in the Mohawk or any other possible phenomena, I'd be very happy to chat with folks after uh, if you have any hypotheses because I mean, we thought in 2016 when we got our work off the ground we might have already missed the boat and that doesn't appear to be the story at all. So what's next? Um, Chris and Meredith, our partners at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, they're going to ultimately go forward and publish the marker comparison between the Nathan et al., Nevers et al., and their, their own marker they developed in-house. That'll be beneficial not only for our work but for anyone interested in doing round goby work in the future. One of my personal goals uh, is to try to relate the DNA quantity in the water to the abundance of goby. I think it's very wishful thinking to think that we're going to be able to do this with a tight predictive relationship and actually say X number of copies per liter corresponds to this density of goby per unit surface area uh, in the river, especially given how patchy goby appear to be. That's going to be very difficult. I do think we can get to a point, especially as goby move through more systems and I have more data, where we can say this DNA quantity corresponds to a high or low goby density and maybe even with a little more resolution in there, but I think it's going to be qualitative, um, unlike some of the work we've been able to do on headwater streams looking at brook trout where we can actually do a little bit better than that. Um, 2019, we're going to be repeating our spring and summer surveys with our standard suite of gear. And we're also going to be doing quantitative uh, electrofishing surveys on a number of high-risk tributaries to the Mohawk, just trying to quantify um, the populations of all fish, but with a particular emphasis on our benthic fishes that are likely to be imperiled uh, by the encroaching goby. And finally, uh, I'm going to give, actually the benthic fish shouldn't have showed up there, I was missed, missed time, but Rod wants some goby for uh, VHS testing, and uh, I'm very happy to oblige because it would be interesting to see if um, you know, VHS is uh, in our Gobi that are on the invasion front. And with that, uh, I need to acknowledge uh, our, our funding source, the Mohawk River Basin Program of the DEC, also the USGS contributed funds. I need to acknowledge the Northeast Fisheries Center, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and finally, the, uh, the majority of the people in that photo have done a great job on this, this project, so we, we thank them very much. Um, and with that, uh, I'm, I'm happy to field uh, any questions. <laughs>